This video is brought to you by our generous supporters on Patreon. IQ tests don't really work very well. In fact, they don't really work at all for what they're meant to do, if what they're meant to do is measure innate intelligence. That's supposed to be something that doesn't change, right? If it's innate, it's supposed to be something that you're born with and you'll die with. But if that's the case, then why do they make study guides and practice tests? Why can your IQ change over time and get higher or lower? Scientists know now that IQ really doesn't measure innate intelligence. Like a lot of standardized tests, all it really measures is how good you are at taking that particular test. But despite this, they have been and continue to be used to try to sort people into arbitrary groups. To try to say that some people are like this, and some people are like this. And that's part of a much larger tendency in humans to try to find constants, to try to divide people into neat little groups. But that usually doesn't work. It usually has pretty bad outcomes. And the truth is that there really aren't any groups that humans cleanly can be divided into. If you're trying to measure something innate, IQ tests aren't designed very well to do that. For example, they have no mechanism to make sure that you take the test seriously. Sometimes, in schools for instance, people are made to take IQ tests, which means that they'll be less than psyched to do it sometimes. And just like with any other test, if you don't try as hard on it, you're not going to do as well. But you've known people, right, who are very smart but don't try very hard? I mean, that's an archetype. Old versions of the test, which aren't used today, but which were used to collect data that's still cited today, often had very little to do with what we would consider innate intelligence. The original Stanford Binet test, for instance, was originally designed for education, and it was used to assess how well students had done in school. One question that the test asked, for example, was, in an old graveyard in Spain, they have discovered a small skull, which they believe to be that of Christopher Columbus, when he was about 10 years old. What is foolish about that? The answer, of course, is that Christopher Columbus didn't die when he was 10 years old. And that's a good question if you're trying to see whether students paid attention in their lesson about Christopher Columbus. But if you're trying to assess innate intelligence, then what if someone doesn't know who Christopher Columbus was? That particular test is not usually used anymore, but a lot of the scientific understanding of IQ for a long time, and a lot of the popular understanding of IQ even today, was built off of data collected using that test. And even modern tests often have some of the same problems. Take for instance, this question. The correct answer is bird, because these letters rearrange to spell parakeet. But what if you've never heard of a parakeet? Cultural context plays a big part, and these tests don't take that into account. UC Berkeley scientist Stephen Piantadowski, for instance, did a study of IQs across cultures, and one of the cultures he studied was the Saimane people, a people indigenous to Bolivia. If run properly, IQ tests should be run in the test taker's native language, though in practice that does not always happen. But the Saimane language does not have any words to label shapes. They don't have words like triangle, square, or circle. That could make it difficult to take a test where large parts of the test are asking you to identify shapes, couldn't it? Or what about this question from the Rutherford Intelligence Analysis? I might say snake because it's not a mammal, but what if you come from a culture that, as many do, keeps dogs as pets but not cats? Then you may read cat and think of lions, tigers, cheetahs, and you may think that the answer is dog because it's the only one that's not a predator. Or to give one more example, here's a question that shows a picture of a teacup and asks you which one goes best with it, a saucer, a truck, flowers, or a pot. As a white person, I want to say saucer because that's the most relevant one to the cultural context I grew up in. But what if you grew up in a context that never had saucers around? What if you had a parent that used a teacup like this to scoop soup out of a pot? Or what if they used it as a vase for flowers? Then your answer could change. Even without questions that expect you to know when Christopher Columbus died, even today, IQ tests are much more a factor of education, nutrition, cultural context, and even how many times you've taken the test or how seriously you take the test than they are of anything innate. 
Despite this though, many people still want to believe that IQ is a valuable measurement and even think that they can use these numbers. IQ scores are sometimes used to determine if a child has an intellectual disability. You find individual instances like this school for gifted children which requires kids to take IQ tests for admissions. There have even been police departments which have set a maximum IQ for applicants convinced that anyone who's too smart will quit before long. Even more notoriously, you have books like The Bell Curve and certain right-wing goons that think that they can group races into IQs, exploiting the differences in education, nutrition, and culture that cause black people to have a lower average IQ than white people to claim scientific proof of the superiority of white people over black people. These kinds of classifications can only be destructive because in fact there are certain groups that tend to score lower on IQ tests. Black and Hispanic people tend to score lower on average, and white and Asian people tend to score higher on average. But this isn't because Asian people are inherently brilliant or that black people are inherently unintelligent. It's because Asian people tend to be wealthier, have better education, and have more access to nutrition. And black people tend to be poorer, have less education, and have poorer nutrition. By segregating people based on IQ, by doing things like having it as a condition of admission at your private school for the gifted, all you're doing is perpetuating these things. You're just making sure that the people who already have opportunity continue to be the people with opportunity, and the people who don't have any opportunity never will. None of this is really unique to IQ though. I see the same patterns in, for instance, BMI. We now know that BMI is not really that useful of a number. It first of all doesn't tell you how much fat you have. John Cena and The Rock are both obese and Jason Momoa is squarely in the overweight category. And second of all it doesn't actually tell you much about health. Turns out health is a lot more complicated than just weight. If you take a fat person that does get their 30 minutes of exercise five times a week and a thin person who does not, then all other things being equal, the thin person will actually be more likely to get health complications than the fat person would. But just like with IQ, people still want to group people into their little boxes with similarly bad results, creating a society where discrimination against fat people is rampant in healthcare and employment and anti-fat bias is pervasive. These are not unlike phrenology, social Darwinism, the alpha beta male distinctions that MRA types like to talk about, the right's attempt to apply RK selection theory to humans, and even astrology. Everyone always wants to class people into immutable characteristics. They always want to say that we can neatly divide people into groups without any ambiguity about who goes in what groups, but that never really works because humans are a lot more complicated than that and that usually has pretty nasty repercussions. The biggest one, of course, is race. What makes me white? The fact that my ancestors came from Britain, I think I never took a DNA test. Well, if that's the case, then if you go back far enough, my ancestors probably looked like this. Is he white? He's from Britain. Most people would say no, but if that's the case, when did Britain start being white? Where's the line that separates me or John Lennon or Boris Johnson from Cheddar Man? For that matter, since every human traced back far enough has roots in Africa, at what point did people start being German or Arab or Chinese or Native American? Where even is the line within those? Are Inuit people from Nunavut and Aztecs from Mexico the same race? Are Britons and Spaniards, Turks and Arabs? Are Han, Uyghur, Manchu, and Hui people all equally Chinese? Are mestizos white? Why isn't Barack Obama white? While people do have physical differences, no one's denying that, where we draw the line to separate one race from another really is arbitrary. And these categories of white, black, Hispanic, Asian, or whatever else you want to throw in there are arbitrary and in fact changing over time. And just like with IQ and BMI, the results of grouping people into these classifications are predominantly negative. The reality is that humanity is incredibly diverse. There are almost 8 billion of us, and no two of us are alike. We defy categorization. No matter where you draw the lines, no matter what categories you create, the lines are never going to be crisp and sharp. The edges are always going to be a little bit fuzzy. 
You can never really create good categories for humans, and trying to will usually just mean more problems and more suffering. So maybe just don't. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that, you can help YouTube categorize this video by hitting that thumbs up button. You can move yourself into the subscribed category and catch the rest of my videos there. And you can increase your IQ by watching another video there. You can drop your IQ back down on social media. The link's in the description. And if you're an intellectual elite like Rebecca S, mainly Julie M, Carolyn P, and Stephen M, you can support this channel at patreon.com slash Report.